appreciate it. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Good afternoon, everyone. Merci d'être présent cet après-midi. Thank you for attending this discussion, which we're going to engage in with Eje Tamilkaran about writing and activism as a way to build a better future together. I wanted to tell you that I'll be speaking French, AJ will be speaking English, so uh, I would advise you to find some headphones so that you can follow along. And our session is going to last at least an hour, and uh, I will uh, save about 15 minutes at the end for questions and answers, so please don't hesitate to hold, uh, raise your hand. We're not in school, and if nobody asks a question, I'm going to volunteer someone. Is that okay? <laughs> okay, I think we're ready. Dear Eche, Tamil Koran, let me introduce you to start with. Thank you for coming today. You were born in 1973 in Turkey. You're a poet, a novelist, as well as a journalist and political commentator. And in fact, you're one of the main Turkish political commentators. You have over 3 million followers on Twitter. More now, maybe? <laughs> Up and down, OK. It's a bit like Twitter shares. <laughs> so you've written uh, about a dozen novels and collections of essays, some of which have been received literary awards. And you've been translated into num a number of languages, including French. You work with The Guardian, The New York Times, The Le Monde Diplomatique, and Der Spiegel. I don't know about Swiss newspapers. Do you work with any Swiss publications? Probably. I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try to publish it. What is our subject today? Well, we're going to be talking about your latest book, which I'm holding up, which you can purchase later and ask Eche to sign. Assembling a future to get, uh, sorry, uh, together, 10 choices for a better now which was published by Stock this past February. And we're also going to be talking about writing as activism, uh, to live together, to take care of one another, reconnect with each other after COVID, after various wars that have gone on and are going on. But before we delve into this uh, topic and try to understand how capitalism, as you write, has breached uh, the contract, a democratic contract and the human rights contract. Uh, it, we see that there's a, a lot of different contexts and we can achieve liberty on our own. But uh, the, as you say, we need to find ways to build a future together. I would like to say a word about current events and get your opinion about what's going on in Ukraine today, uh, amongst other things. But let me say that, uh, well, there's a war in Ukraine. It's very difficult. I'd like to know what your take on the conflict is. Uh, what about Turkey's role, Erdogan's role? And then we'll come back to your book. Thank you for mentioning Merci my age, Patrick. <laughs> um, I won't do it again, says Patrick. With you here. Uh, we have been talking for the last three hours already. Uh, so we actually talked about everything in our lives. Uh, so we're going to do a repeat for you now. <laughs> um, Ukraine, yeah. Um, it is tragic, it is absurd, it is unbelievable, uh, it is at times incomprehensible, but most of it all is, it is frightening me. Uh, many people are dying and a nation, you know, majority of a nation, not majority, but a, a big part of the nation is fleeing the country towards Western countries and probably to Switzerland. They're coming to Switzerland as well. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, in every European country, in every European city, 
there are these peace protests, uh, very rightfully so. People, you know, colored themselves in blue and yellow in support of Ukraine. But then, uh, I think there is something missing there. Um, we forget that at the very beginning, Russian people, despite all the danger, risking their lives, um, they protested this war. And they were imprisoned, they were tortured, beaten by Putin's regime. So, I am kind of afraid that this war will create an anti-Russian sentiment all around Europe. And I am afraid that people are equating Putin with Russian people. I'm coming from Turkey. Uh, from outside of Turkey, you can only see Erdogan. And you might think that Turkey is Erdogan. It is so unfair for the people of Turkey to be equated with Erdogan. And it is so unfair for Russians to be equated with Putin. They are living under, even then, they were brave enough to go out on the streets uh, to say no to war. So I am thinking, would there be a way uh, to organize a peace movement that would include the Russians who are critical of Putin's regime, Ukrainians, Europeans, and so on. And it is going somewhere very dangerous, as you can see. I'm like Finland is becoming NATO member, Sweden is becoming a NATO member. So, you know, all the neutrality is going, uh, going away. So we are going back to this uh, two polar uh, world uh, order, which didn't do good f uh, in the first time round. I don't think it will do good for us in the second time. So it is quite fearful. We were speaking, we're talking about nuclear war now. It is like a joke, but it can be real in a minute. So this whole thing is incomprehensible and it's quite fearful. Uh, and I'm not sure we are aware of, uh, the, it's so incomprehensible that I am not sure we are really grasp, grasping the gravity of the situation. At the same time, uh, you're, you're very critical of Europeans, European countries. In an interview with Correa de la Serra, uh, you explained that Europeans don't understand how, uh, which is surprising, how authoritarian regimes function. We have the impression that we've had a lot of totalitarian regimes, but it's true, we don't seem to understand how they work. And in fact, you wrote a book about it, How to Lose a Country. Uh, Putin must have read it and applied it step by step. Or maybe he didn't need it, who knows. Uh, but it's, it's surprising, isn't it? It's surprising that we as Europeans can be so blind a bit like we were, we were talking about Obama, uh, the, uh, the way we've been with uh, Erdogan. Uh, haven't we learned anything from history, from our own history? Well, how, how, do you, how do you see this? Uh, do you have an explanation, perhaps, for this? Uh, you know what? I mean, like, during the pandemic, people were uh, missing the old times. They were reminiscing uh, before the, the, their life in, before 2019. I had zero things to miss because since 2016, I've been going around Europe and actually around the world uh, from Washington to Sydney, including all the cities in Europe and telling people that it is coming towards them. What we have experienced in Turkey is going to happen in Europe. In 2016, I looked like a mad woman saying these things. I was saying that, you know, Boris Johnson will be your prime minister, Trump is here to stay, and so on. And then, like, what, six years later now, uh, Le Pen is getting 20%, uh, Orban is still here, 
Trump is running for a second time. There was Capitol Hill insurrection and whatnot. You know, it's, it's horrifying. Uh, Europeans do not understand is one way to put it, <laughs> but I would rather put it like this. They think that all these things that happen in Russia, in uh, you know, Turkey, uh, in Italy or in India wouldn't happen in their countries because these are already crazy countries. <laughs> but then they weren't crazy countries before these things happened. Well, they weren't as crazy, let's put it that way. And they have this exceptionalism in Europe, in Western Europe especially, and in the United States, thinking that their institutions will prevent the right-wing populism, will prevent the society from fascism, racism, anti-Semitism, and so on. No, it doesn't. Because institutions um, are falling apart. We are going through a serious crisis of representative democracy. We are going through a serious crisis of capitalism. So there are no more uh, institutions that you can comfortably, comfortably depend on. No institution will protect you from fascism, racism, or right-wing populism. This is what they didn't really get, because after the Cold War, or no, after the Second World War, I think they got so used to having these institutions. They got so used to thinking that they are very mature democracies. Uh, they never thought that democracy needs protection as well. Um, so, uh, well, you're a historian, you know better than I do. Uh, that there was no act actual, um, you know, calling fascism into account in, in, in nowhere in Europe. That's another story, though. Um, but anyway, so it took some time for them to understand that right-wing populism is a global phenomenon. How to lose a country uh, was telling the seven common global patterns of right-wing populism in the world, and it took some time for them to see that they are actually following these patterns as well in, in Western European countries. So, you know, the, the reason I wrote this book uh, was not to talk about Turkey, actually, was to tell the Europeans, the Western societies, that it's coming to them. Thus, we need a global solidarity against fascism. Uh, I think we're coming there. I hope it's not too, too late to be in solidarity because we need that solidarity among the peoples uh, to, to stop uh, fascism to seize, uh, from seizing power all over Europe. Let me just come back to the uh, uh, seven steps to autocracy when you say that populism is a real risk. Uh, uh, there are several stages, create a movement, disrupt rationale, diminish the truth. It's incredible today to see, I mean, look at Le Pen. Her, when you talk about her cats, she gets 42% of the vote. Uh, it's crazy. Uh, immorality is the new black. That's for, for Trump. Dismantle mechanisms, toy with institutions and replace them with your own. That's what we saw in Turkey. Create your own citizens. Give them a parallel reality with fake stories. That reminds us of, of Germany. Create the real people, the true people. What is the true people? And that's a, a debate that uh, you cover in Seven Steps to Autocracy. Let the people laugh at the horror. We're saying, well, all of this is not, not serious. I mean, it, it, it looks a little ugly, but uh, go ahead and laugh. And it's, in Ukraine, what we're seeing today is is along these logical lines, letting people laugh at the horror. Build your own country. Uh, a, a country invented from nothing, a parallel universe that has nothing to do with our needs or desires, the needs or desires of the people. I read this, and then I reread it a, a couple of years later, and I thought, this is crazy. We're right in the middle of this. It's happening now. So with respect to the substance, is the uh, who, whose fault is it? Is it internet? Is it uh, overfed Western societies who don't think they need to fight for anything anymore? How, 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 what's your analysis of this? Because 
uh, we, we've been warned, and in fact, you've warned us, and we can now see these things happening. Trump is one phenomenon, but only one. Uh, so things are things are going forward. We'll come back to your solutions in a minute, but I'd like to know what your take on this is. Oh, good. We, as humankind, we couldn't find a solution to psychopaths suddenly seizing power. We were talking with Sion yesterday about this. I mean, like, there is a problem in humankind when there is a ruthless leader who suddenly shows up, there is this moment of mesmeration, like, what? What's happening? And then while you're mesmerized and paralyzed, and while you cannot really understand where all this evil coming from, they take, uh, take, take over power, they you know, redesign the people, they redesign the politics, and then finally they redesign the country. So there is a dark matter in human that causes fascism, but let's leave it aside and come back to real politic and politics today, why it's happening. <laughs> well, you know, there are two uh, views about this. Some people say that it is because, you know, it, it's a glitch in the system. It's a hack in the system. You know, Trump or, you know, Orban or Erdogan, they hacked the system. They kind of, you know, accidentally became um, leaders and then they changed everything. And if they can only get rid of these guys, everything will be back to normal. You know, it will be business as usual if we can only get rid of these, these leaders. This is a very, very popular view because there are many books about fascism today, right-wing populism and so on. Whereas I think it is not like that. It is not about these guys because they have millions of supporters. Where did these people come from suddenly, right? And they are devotees. I mean, like they want to die for these leaders and so on. So there must be something in the system that creates, that produces these these leaders and their followers. My idea is that this was already, uh, right-wing populism is already embedded, um, seeded in neoliberal system. Uh, and it is because, it happened because democracy, representative democracy failed in its fundamental promise, which was equality. And when there is no social justice, it is so easy for a ruthless leader to come and exploit the system, uh, to break the system and organize and mobilize the ignorant masses to make choices against their interests. Because, you know, when there is no social justice, there, there are no equal citizens. There are no citizens with the political agency. These, are not su these people are not subjects, political subjects anymore, but they are political objects because they are poor. And if, they, if you give them bread and hope and some really nice, sexy lies, you can turn them into supporters. So it is in the system. When there is no social justice, there is no democracy. What you get without, from democracy without social justice is the theatrics of it. It's the parliament, you know, people talk, you know, these parliamentarians talking to each other. It is the entire theatrics of it, but it is underneath, it's empty. I think the fundamental uh, contract of capitalism has prevailed over the fundamental promise of democracy. And that is why we have these guys. This is a, this is a systemic crisis. It is happening all around the world. Uh, Right-wing populism is you know, becoming more and more powerful. Even if they don't seize the power, they reshape the politics. You know, Le Pen didn't get it, mm -hmm. but then she pulled the entire political sphere to the right. You see? I mean, like, one fascist is too many already, but uh, they are incredibly efficient in shaping the, you know, shaping the political sphere in a country once they appear in the political stage. So uh, this is the system, and we have to, it is not enough to get rid of these people, uh, these political leaders, but we have to do something with the system because the lack of social justice creates right-wing populism. 
uh, this is not a very popular view because it meddles with capitalism, it meddles with the system and so on. So they don't like this point of view, but this is unfortunately the truth. Uh, they think that you know Macron can hold the center, uh, Biden can hold the center, but the problem is center is not holding anymore. It's not happening. So we need more Bernie Sanders. We need we need more Alexandra Octavia Cortez. We need more progressives, more leftists, and so on. I think we are at the end living the. Um, the consequences of Cold War, but that's a long topic that needs discussing hours. <laughs> yes, well, we're here to talk about that too, but if we say that democracy is in crisis, that democracy is not regenerating itself, uh, perhaps we're not good at challenging the structures and finding solutions. And I agree with you, uh, there can't be justice or democracy without social justice. We can't uh, use injustice to uh, deal with the problems, and that's what we're seeing in France with the Gilets Jaunes, and uh, in Switzerland it's less so because we're still a rich country, but we see this in other countries, in the US with the Occupy Wall Street. Uh, we can f sense that there's a world movement cropping up. Now, I was teasing you earlier when I said that you were like a prophet with 10 solutions, 10 choices, but uh, you are a bit of a pilgrim. You're going around the country, going around the world, uh, advocating writing as activism. Uh, so let's start with the ideas that you present in your book. You can still buy the book after the session because uh, you will get the discussion in that way. There are 10 choices. Choose determination over hope. So that's a position that includes uh, religious traditions. We can talk about this. Re choose the whole reality. Yes, it's true. If I understand the simplified messages of uh, social media, Twitter, and all that are to be prescribed. Uh, the reality is much more complicated. Embrace fear over the cold comfort of ignorance. I'd like us to come back to that because I think that often we are, how can I put this, a uh, bit naive about the reality of the world. Choose dignity over pride. I like the idea of dignity, and I hope we'll have time to come to that later. Choose attention over anger. Okay. Choose strength over power. Uh, I think all Swiss people would agree with you. Choose enough over less. I like the idea of enough over less. Choose the reef over the wreck. You'll have to explain that one. Choose friendship. I don't understand why it's not love, but anyway, maybe you'll explain that too. And choose to be together. The idea of being together, that's where I think you're, you know, a bit like uh, Christ. Uh, you, uh, it hasn't worked in the past. I guess you're more optimistic. Now, if I understand correctly, uh, your book, uh, Ten Choices for a Better Now, is a pandemic book, in a way. You were in Zagreb. You s talk about an episode where you saw somebody at the, uh, when you were throwing out your trash and you started talking. But the book also uh, is perhaps a response to your other book. Here we're losing our country, and what are the solutions to not lose the country with some new ideas? Is that a correct uh, analysis of your uh, line of thinking, and then we can come back to your book. Absolutely. Because, you know, I was going around like Cassandra telling people, like, this is going to happen to you, you're going to lose your country, be careful, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then, you know, I talked to I don't know how many audiences, and every time I finished talking, there was this solemn silence, like, you know, obviously I convinced them. <laughs> uh, and they and at some point, the one person from the audience was asking me, so where is hope? So, you know, I, I, I heard this question for so many times in different languages, in different parts of the world. It, it started to, you know, disturb me a lot. Like, you know, what do you want from me? 
like, what? what? And then I started thinking about hope. And then I started asking back to the audiences, like, uh, what if there is no hope? What are you going to do differently tomorrow? Or what is there is hope? What if there is hope? What are you going to do differently tomorrow? Or that, then maybe this question is inconsequential anyway. It doesn't change anything in your life. So maybe we have to use another word and so on. So I started thinking about this. And then, yeah, so many people ask me about the way out. And I'm going around and telling people, democracy, you have to you know, protect democracy. <clears throat> but what is it? I mean, like, at the end of the day, it boils down to this question. Would you die for it or not? Because you are facing regimes with leaders and with millions of people who, will, who are very ready to die for it. But do we have an emotional connection with democracy that, you know, let alone dying for it, uh, but enough emotional connection to go and protect it like on a Sunday afternoon in a protest? So this lack of emotional connection to democracy, this lack of connection to political activism, made me think, because they were asking where is the, what is the way out to me, and I was telling them we have to come together, we have to do something. But then there is, the motivation is not there. Why is not the motivation there? Because there is no emotional connection to this, you know, political situation. People, as if felt like to me, they lost not hope, but faith. Like, what are we going to do? For what? For whom? Like, does it worth it? And so on. So I started thinking about, like, you know, maybe we should replace the word hope with faith. Obviously, faith is a religious word. But then I was thinking, maybe we could take this word from, take back this word from religion. We can risk, if we can rescue it from the monopoly of religion and put it in politics and create the secular faith in humankind, then we might have an emotional connection and also we can have the enough, we can have enough motivation to save our democracies. So this was the beginning of Ensemble. And I thought, this is a heartless world, as Karl Marx once put it. He said, you know, religion is the heart for a heartless world. So can we create a secular heart for this heartless world? And how can we create this? Okay, we are talking about politics with political terms, but yeah, okay, it's boring. Uh, it doesn't touch any hearts. It rarely does. Um, and it doesn't move people anymore. The facts do not convince people anymore. I mean, like, everybody, every, every day there's someone who is telling us that the oxygen levels is this and that, and we are losing the planet, and it doesn't really move the masses, which is weird, right? Actually, it should, but it doesn't. Uh, because facts do not make people move. It is the emotions, it is the, uh, it is the dedication, the convictions, and so on. So, how can we create that dedication, conviction, and determination? So I thought we need a new vocabulary for progressive politics. We need a new vocabulary for anti-fascists of the world. So that's why I wrote this, you know, ensemble. And also there's the personal reason, which is after how to lose a country, after reading, writing, and talking about fascism for I don't know how many years, I kind of felt I lost my faith in people as well. And I wanted to heal my um, politics and my moral values as well. Vous le dites d'ailleurs hein, dans votre bouquin qu'à un moment donné... Avant, and in your, in your book you say that uh, you can even wonder if man is worth saving. Should we even try? Or, or if mankind is not the worst creature on earth. So there was a moment of discouragement and then uh, your motivation comes back and you say no. I want to fight for humankind. Is this perhaps 
finalement à votre vie personnelle en réalité. Uh, related to your uh, personal life, the fact that you had to leave your country, your family, now you're a uh, nomad in Europe, is there... Uh, is it because you're weary of uh, trying to drive home this message and you feel like people aren't listening as much as they sh really should be? Patrick, I don't want to, I don't like talking about the personal side of this story, you know, why, what I have lost, you know, and what I have sacrificed and so on, because I don't want to get into that, I don't want to be pigeonholed in that cliche mm -hmm. of the intellectual woman, you know, running away from the barbarians, throwing herself into the arms of Western civilization. That victimhood is so humiliating for me. Non, mais changeons peut-être l'idée. No, but the idea is not uh, necessarily that. Uh, the idea is that you describe a human being and the question is whether he's worth saving or not. Uh, some people have done horrible things to you and in the end you say to yourself, well, do I need to fight for them? That's the message of the, of the book, isn't it? Without uh, touching on the personal aspects. So, is uh, humankind uh, so rotten in the end? It is not. Hmm. 21st century is an interesting century. This is the first century uh, that we are seeing the evil in people more than in any time we've experienced. Because we are you know, connected to each other with social media. Social media uh, runs on certain algorithms, and the most engaging emotion uh, on social media is anger, hatred, repulsiveness, and disgusting, and so on. Outrageous, uh, the, whatever outrageous is. Uh, so we keep seeing the worst representations of our kind on social media. And that becomes our reality almost, like you know, our perception of humankind. And the whole reality is different, and that's another chapter in the book. But being constantly subjected to the worst representations of our kind has actually, I think, shaped our perception of humankind in a very, very dangerous way. I see many young people thinking that, do we, you know, asking the question, do we deserve to exist as humankind as much as elephants, let's say? I understand why they think that, because they, they think, like, you know, we're losing the planet and nobody's doing anything, uh, so they think that humankind is stupid. This is one part of it, but then if we, th if we stop believing that, there is nothing to do. We, have all, we should all go into mass, uh, committing, uh, mass suicide, and that should be the end of it. And we have been injected with this understanding of, uh, with this defi definition of humankind, uh, especially uh, since the late 1970s. Neoliberal definition of huma humankind, uh, neoliberal definition of human is selfish, self-centered, meek, competitive. Uh, th there's nothing good in that human. And this has been imposed on us by what, through violence, actually. So we somehow adopted this definition. And I think in order to, be, in order to resist this system, we have to go back to that definition and redefine the human. So in, according to this neoliberal definition, we are creatures who survive, period. But actually, the reality is, yes, we survive, but we survive by creating beauty. We survive by creating political beauty. We survive by creating, uh, you know, natural beauty, whatever beauty you can think of. Um, there are many stories about this in the book, but one of them is, um, one of them is the most important to me. Um, my editor, my Dutch editor, uh, told me this story about 
her grandfather and grandfather, grandfather and grandmother meeting in Auschwitz. And they're very young, young man, young girl, and it's Auschwitz, uh, it's a horrible situation. And the boy falls in love with the girl, uh, and then somehow he finds a little rotten cabbage. He puts the cabbage on a, he sticks the cabbage on a stick, and he gives this cabbage on a stick to, a, to the girl. And then they, fell in, they fall in love, and that's the end of the story. This is, this is something that tells a lot about humankind. Yes, sticking the cabbage to the stick and pretending that it's a rose is something already, it's beautiful, creating beauty and trying to survive by creating beauty. But on the other hand, there is the girl who accepts to see the cabbage as a rose. So this is a contract between two people about creating beauty. This is the essence of humankind, I think. And I need to believe that. Uh, I choose to believe that. It is not that I believe that. I make a moral choice to believe in that. Otherwise, I, I'll become a fascist who thinks that humans are meek, um, uh, you know, uh, selfish and you know, useless unless they come together uh, to form a mass. So, in order to be political, in order to do politically right things, we have to find the humankind beautiful. Otherwise, why would we do anything for it anyway, right? Le mm -hmm. mot ensemble. <laughs> The word uh, together is quite self-evident, it's part of the title, but the word together is very important for you. We spoke about it a while ago. From what I've understood, the idea is uh, not to say that there's an elite that imposes things on us, but that we uh, build together a future, a common future. Now, very pragmatically speaking, up here we're speaking uh, in philosophical terms. Uh, it's a very global reflection, but uh, pragmatically, how could this work? Politically, how could this work? Could it work uh, like in Switzerland by direct democracy? How do you imagine things if uh, we want to translate this uh, in our daily and then we'll come back to this? boring things now. About Switzerland, for example. Like deliberative democracy, like, you know, um, participatory democracy and so on. The thing is, this is so interesting. Um, whenever I talk about these things, uh, there are many people, I don't say it's you, but there are many people who the f uh, whose first reaction is, but then is it possible? Mm -hmm. This is a very dangerous question. Mm -hmm. Because if you're asking about, oh, is it possible, which is a rhetoric question, of course, which you are meaning it's impossible, uh, disregarding anything uh, that is uh, not, that seems impossible is already giving in uh, to fascism, if, we are if you're talking about new ways for democracy. Uh, and by the way, I mean, togetherness and the possibility of togetherness uh, you know, we, I think we've learned enough during pandemic about this on two levels. One, we learned that our instinct is not competition, but solidarity. Because people, majority of people, majority of people in the world wanted to help each other. Amazing information about humankind, firsthand, very fresh knowledge that we have. Uh, and secondly, during the pandemic, people risked their lives to get together to protect their dignity. I'm talking about Black Lives Matter, I'm talking about Hong Kong, I'm talking about several other protests that happened during the pandemic. So there is an inclination, a natural inclination of humans to be together anyway. Uh, the opposite is unnatural. 
I think you know what we gathered the, as a knowledge in during pandemic can be politicized because we did it. We did something very interesting. Uh, all around the world, people um, created mutual aid groups. Ve you know, right on the spot, very quickly, very efficiently. So this gave us a new uh, experience. Now we know how we can operate. Uh, in the absence of institutions, because there was no institution we could depend on pan during the first, you know, months of the pandemic. So we actually saw that we can do it. This is a very, very important experience uh, in terms of creating a new democracy. But then new democracy is not only about creating new ways of decision-making bodies, it's about social justice, and we never should forget that. You know, something has to be done with capitalism before uh, or during the time we work for, uh, for democracy. It's impossible otherwise. Au travail que l'on fait sur la démocratie, sinon ce sera impossible. In your 10 choices for a better now and for a better future, to make things simple, uh, there's uh, something uh, that struck me, and it's uh, choosing uh, the whole reality. Is it that the media don't do this job anymore? They no longer have the means to do so? And how can we correct this in actual fact? We're both journalists, and we realize that the world uh, as we've known it has disappeared because of social media, because of uh, the new economy of the media. Is this a choice where we have to reposition journalism, observation, the fact that we're witnesses of facts? Well, you're doing it yes, with slow journalism, with your magazine perfectly well. Um, I think most of all, we have to tell people that what they are having from social media, this snippets of uh, information is not information. Because they really think that that is information. People uh, think that, oh, I, I'm going through Facebook, Twitter, I'm done with news. Well, that's not news. First of all, you're getting your news from a, a private company uh, sphere. Uh, algorithms, uh, is, uh, algorithms are deciding what you're going to read. Uh, and they are trying to make you happy rather than unhappy. Uh, they're trying to tell you what you want to hear um, through algorithms, not you have to hear. So I think, uh, you know, we have to keep on telling that this is not information, this is not journalism, this is not, this is not how we get to democracy. People think that this, you know, post-truth thing, this lies and so on, journalism, we have to defend journal journalists, it's like a boring cliche. But then there is this slogan, uh, you know, in the journalism protests that I keep seeing, which is so true. It says, they, t they first took the journalists and then we don't know what happened. It is true. I mean, like, it is not a coincidence that every right-wing populist leader first start with, uh, you know, uh, uh, being hostile to journalists. Because once you get the journalists, then you can do, you know, once you lock up the journalists, you can do anything you like, which happened in Turkey, which happened in Russia, India, everywhere. It happened the same way. Uh, yeah. And I'm looking forward to what Elon Musk will do with Twitter that can change the world. Indeed. Before we turn towards the floor for questions from the audience, uh, I'd have one last question. Actually, I have many more questions because what you're saying is fascinating. Choosing friendship over love, really. Why do you have to choose friendship and not love? That's something that I don't understand. Well, I understood it reading your book, but I'd like to ask you this question anyway. <laughs> uh, friendship. No, I mean... Uh, <laughs> no, the, the Maybe both. I'm, I'm, I'm becoming this evangelist. 
person. <laughs> and then they take, you know, when I speak, I do this with my hands, and they, they pick, take pictures of me right now, Toria <laughs> is doing, and then I really look like an evangelist, yeah. it's televangelist <laughs> preacher. Uh, it's weird. Um, friendship is a philosophical and political concept. I mean, like, since Aristo, all the, philo not all, but many philosophers, uh, like Spinoza, Hannah Arendt, uh, Simone Weil, everybody was talking about this friendship. Because friendship is the most beautiful human relationship, because it is the place where ultimate justice can happen. Ultimate justice. In no other human relationship, including love affairs, ultimate justice cannot happen. But in that relationship we call friendship, there is a chance that it might happen. Uh, so friendship is an attempt between humans to have ultimate justice uh, on a personal level. So I was thinking, can we uh, re redefine our political connections through friendship? Because citizenship is not working. Political membership, political party membership is not working. You know, comradeship is not really working. It sounds so retro now, and so on. So how about we become friends? By the way, I am uh, doing this project, if you're interested. Uh, it's called Letters From Now. I'm writing letters every week about the concepts in this book. Uh, and people are writing back to me. It's a global network of friends. It's like letter friends. You can go to lettersfromnow.com and become a member. And we are having monthly Zoom meetings with all the friends around the world. It's an interesting community. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm actually trying myself uh, to do that. It's not that we're going to become best friends all of a sudden with the entire humanity. But can we imagine being more friendly to people in our political relations? Because there is something missing in our political uh, connections. Let's say we are party members. It doesn't work. It's, it's not really getting into us, not enough. So that's why I, I mentioned friendship. Of course, there's, there are other reasons. But I think this is the most important part, uh, considering the politics and democracy. Politique et démocratique. Je sais pas si vous avez des questions. I'm turning towards the audience to see whether there are questions. Il y a un micro qui va arriver. With a microphone. Important pour l'enregistrement. It's uh, very important for the recording and for the interpreters so that they may hear the question. Thank you for taking my question. So my question has to do with the role of the basic income in any society. Is, is, if societies decided that when you turn 18, for example, you are automatically given 1,500, 2,000, 3,000, let's say in Europe, uh, euros per month. In Canada, for example, we had the baby bonus. So mothers were mailed a check, you know, to of, I mean, it was a couple of hundred per month to help with um, raising children. Uh, the Swiss rejected a referendum, um, I think it was last I year. This, yeah. <laughs> the Swiss <laughs> rejected a referendum last year on, you know, the basic income, which you probably are aware of. But um, I didn't, but I'm not surprised. Sorry? Oh, I, am, okay. I didn't, but I am not surprised. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think I think the fear is that you know people feel that you know people will will sit around, you know, drinking coke and eating chips all day if they've got their government check coming every every month. But um, I I think that this could be a way to restore human dignity for. So if you're a billionaire, it doesn't matter. You get when you turn 18 you get your 1500 or 5000 a month or you know if you decide not to work you 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 know you, you still get the money so um, 
Yeah, I just, I've been curious about, uh, I'm curious about your thoughts about how the basic income might help well, us. Well, universal towards... basic income is one of the demands. Well, it, 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 it is interesting actually. Uh, like five years ago, this, not 10 years ago, this would like be, oh my God, it's impossible. But now it's becoming a mainstream demand for progressives, which is, which it should be, by the way, universal basic income. Because there is, there should be a way to uh, really trickle down the uh, accumulated, uh, you know, riches, because the, the, the you know, the, the social gap, uh, social in oh my God, income gap is, has become so dramatic that we have to find a way to redistribute it. But then this word, redistribution, is like, uh-oh. You know, it can get you killed in certain parts of the world. <laughs> um, redistribution is still um, a taboo word for our system. But unfortunately, it shouldn't be. Because otherwise, uh, higher echelons of capitalism in Davos know that form, and they are even becoming you know, a little bit like they're secretly in love with socialism as if, you know, they started sounding like that because they are talking about universal basic income as well. So yes, we should, we should raise this demand uh, and we should make it mainstream because it's the logical thing to do. Period. End of story. Otherwise, you won't have a democracy in Bern or in, in, in the fancy parts of Lausanne. No, I mean, because one of the slogans of the uh, uprisings is if you're hungry, you're not going to get peace. So yeah, if they want to sustain capitalism, at least, you know, they have to do this universal basic income. It is the logical thing to do for them as well, for, you know, the rich. <laughs>
uh, mainly in Croatia. Were you forced into exile or was it a voluntary exile? And then my second question a while ago, you spoke about dictatorships or dictators. I lived in Turkey. I'm also in exile. So I know about it. What's the reaction of uh, Western countries vis-a-vis -vis these dictators? Thank you. Well, yes, you're right. I, I um, Well, currently I'm in Hamburg, but I uh, left Turkey for Zagreb in 2016 after, military, after the military coup attempt. Uh, does any exile choose to exi go ex to exile? I'm not sure. But then I, you know, I actually told Patrick before we got on the stage, I said, by the way, don't call me an exile. Uh, because that word is too heavy for me emotionally, one. And second, once you wear it, it's impossible to take it off, even if you go back to your country. So emotionally and for several other reasons, I don't want that word to be near my name. Although, every time I'm on the stage, somebody tells that I'm an exile. <laughs> of course, I'm de facto so, but I don't call myself an exile. Uh, Western dictators is a great topic of mine. I love to talk about this, because it wasn't until 2013, the Gezi uprising, uh, that we could explain the way, uh, I could explain to Western audiences that Erdogan is becoming a dictator. And after Gezi uprising, it became clear to them that something is happening in Turkey. Before that, they saw him as a real democrat and, you know, representing the real people and so on. And they looked at me like a mad woman who is supporting the army against democracy, who is uh, anti-democratic, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then after Gizzi uprising in 2013, they understood that something is wrong with the regime. And it was too late. They supported him so much. They supported him so much. And it's, I'm sure they regret it now. There are many people in every European country who come up to me, you know, on the decision-making level and apologize for their support for Erdogan, for their earlier support for Erdogan. Well, it's too late. They didn't listen to us at the time. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Hello. Um, my question was just for some precision on social justice because uh, you've used the term quite a few times. And I was just thinking of the categories of Rawlsian and justice, that you can have a, a recognitional justice and participatory justice and distributive justice. And my question was specifically from a journalistic perspective, because you've spoken about the way that mainstream journalism has been shut down in dictatorships. And you've talked about the way that Twitter, which is a really participatory form, can kind of give a, a, a perspective that you want to hear. So from my thinking, the traditional journalism is very good at a recognitional justice. But what I think you're doing here in terms of an interview form and speaking to and with and perhaps as friends might have something to do with a participatory justice and including us in the conversation. So I wondered if you could just speak to that ensemble of ideas. Thank you. Oh, lovely question. It's almost like a academic article. Uh, well, I'm like, yeah. Um, distributive justice would be nice for economy at the moment, wouldn't it? Hmm. I think you said it all. I think we need it all. Participatory, distributive, recognitional. One thing for recognitional, maybe. Hmm. Yeah. I think right-wing populism thrived on this manufactured victimhood. Uh, and they, uh, these leaders, organized the anger of the masses by giving them 
an illusion of recognitional justice. They everywhere, in, uh, in every country, they said, uh, they left us behind, there, there is the elite, they don't recognize us, and so on and so forth. And they created this anger, or they manipulated the existing anger to uh, steer the masses towards making you know, massive mistakes, massive political mistakes. I think recognitional justice would be a good topic to write about in terms of right-wing populism. Thank you for making me think this. I don't know if there's one last question before we wrap up and give you the chance to get uh, your book signed. Yes, I'd like to know what you think about youth, young people learning about your ideas. Uh, do, what, how do you think they're reacting? People like Greta Thunberg. Since I was in Athens, uh, I was with Jeremy Corbyn, the uh, former Labour Party leader in, in England. And I was telling him, you know what, you two old men, Bernie Sanders and you, you made socialism sexy for young people. Because we ha you know, our memories were erased, especially in Western Europe and in the United States. Uh, so much so that young people thought that socialism is a new idea, like newly invented idea. Um, I think, you know, the reason I said this, I think they're very angry with us young people, especially with my generation and with the previous generation, because we didn't do enough, I'm like, or they think that we didn't do enough. And, you know, they found all these massive crises on their laps. And they have zero hope about future. And also, isn't it interesting that we are the first generation in humankind who is absolutely sure that their children's life are going to be worse than theirs. This is so, we're already mourning uh, for the things we're going to lose in the future. We are mourning for the future already. And the kids are doing the same thing. And they're angry, very angry, because they, don't, they won't have economic power, enough economic power to have a house, car. They don't believe in the big promise of capitalism, you know, work hard, you're going to be very successful, blah, blah. So I think they're looking for words to express their anger. Socialism might be one of them. Or maybe, you know, dignity might be one of them that I proposed in this book. Uh, or uh, several, they are looking for new words um, to gather around and express their anger and express their rejection of this course of history. I hope they're, they are, you know, I hope they will support my words or the new words that they're going to find themselves because unfortunately we are depending on the new generation. So far we didn't do good enough, I think, our generation. Okay. Eh? Voilà. Très bien. Oui. Eh? <laughs> Merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci Etje pour uh, pour échange. Thank you very much Etje. Merci beaucoup. Oh, merci. Alors, je compte sur vous maintenant, Etche. So, Etche is going upstairs. The signing session can take place, and you can continue talking with uh, people who may have other questions uh, that they can ask up there. So, I wish you a very good weekend, safe trip home. <laughs>